technology, uh, by way of hearing a lot of theater people talk about how it was the death of theater, and how people were just watching computer screens and TV screens and not going to the theater anymore. And coming from a computer family, like my grandmother was a software engineer and my mom worked on the F-15 fighter planes, um, I think that's a simplified or a simplistic way of looking at technology. We use it for as many things uh, as we use any other tool for. We use it to do the things we want to do. And what we want to do as artists is evolving with our tools. So I've been super, super blessed to have amazing people on my panel. This is Sarah Kraft, a multimedia artist and artistic director of Kraft Work. Um, this is Desdemona Chang, director and uh, a zeotrope, artistic director? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. Um, co-founder of Sick Directors. Yeah, yeah. And David Slaza, and uh, video and multimedia also. Yeah. yeah. The vocabulary fails us because a lot of the work that people are doing that's pushing the boundaries of technology and theater doesn't have a name yet, or it falls into that catch-all multimedia. So, um, that being said, what interests do people have in theater and technology in here? Because we wanted to sort of calibrate what we're talking about to people's interests and experience so that we're not talking under or above what people are actually interested in. What are you guys interested in? Do you use, the, do you use technology in your own work? Are you interested in storytelling? Are you interested in learning new technologies? All of that. All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. Yeah. And also working with our sister unions on how to make that happen in theater. Yeah. yeah. New media technology. Um, well, I can tell you I am really interested in projection mapping as a way to steal the things that are cool about film and add it to sort of the three-dimensional architecture of things that are best of theater to make it much better. Yeah. Building on that, aesthetics, just aesthetics from the theater as applied towards new media and digital uh, delivery. Could you explain that a little bit more? Uh, well, we're, we're talking about applying theatrical approaches or, or pieces of theater in a theater context, right? That's why we're here is talking about theater. But we're talking about it in a non-traditional space, which is a virtual space. How does that play? It's a different thing when you're creating that sort of aesthetic content for a virtual space as opposed to a live theater space. Right, so theater for non-live relationship spaces. Yeah. Uh, this is sort of a broad catch-all, but what I'm interested in is finding ways that theater and technology intersect in which it's not simply technology providing a background for the theater or on the other side of it, we're theater artists doing something cool with technology. Like where, does, where do we actually get to the point where both things are serving the experience that's being created in a, in a unique way that couldn't happen in any other context? Yeah. One of the things I was excited about when inviting these panelists is that they're all doing a lot of that kind of work. It's, it's not you put a show together and you're like, ooh, what tech can we bring to it? But exploring questions through all the available tools, technology being one of them. And there's questions of which, you know, how, what's your ratio? When does something, how much tech can you use before it's no longer a theater? Um, whether that's even a useful question at all, yeah. are theater and um, new media of all sorts moving towards a yet undiscovered third thing that will be so obvious to future generations are going to laugh at us for resisting it for so long. So, when they already are. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, with that said, I would love to turn over the, uh, the stage to my panelists. Do you want to go first? I'll so, so, to to, to, to do an intro? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so just a little about my, myself, my work. I guess, um, so, well, has anyone here seen my work? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I don't have to explain it. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, I'll show a couple, you can actually first start the first question, I'll just talk over it because it doesn't, the audio doesn't matter. Um, I've been making work that is about our relationship with media and technology and um, mediated experience um, for decades and um, with whatever tools were available at the time. So um, I started in the early 90s with um, crappy video <laughs> and, um, and 35 millimeter or 16 millimeter or 8 millimeter film um, and uh, little you know tape cassette um, players and uh, whatever I could get my hands on and have you know 
gradually graduated um, with the technology as it graduated and evolved. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of my work has always been about my own and, and come out of my own uh, very charged and somewhat conflicted relationship with technology and media. And um, as somebody who I think probably a lot of people in this room probably share this experience, at some point in my life I had to make the choice about whether I was going to choose a career in the performing arts and live arts or choose a career in um, di what is now digital video or film or um, forms of different forms of media. And, um, and that's been a very difficult choice, I think, for some of us and continues to be a really um, interesting and challenging choice. And so um, I did have a career for a while in film and um, video production, uh, specializing in special effects and 3D animation, um, uh, digital effects. And I started in, in inevitably to incorporate that into my performance work. So you can go ahead and play. Um, this clip. I um, uh, so I I I write shows. Um, oh, did you already play? <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Here, no, you don't have to play it again. It's fine. Um, so uh, for me, I I always work with whatever tools I'm working with are very integral and central to the process from the very beginning, and the work is often written and shaped around um, my interaction and the other performers or collaborators' interaction with those tools so that it isn't um, a kind of design process that isn't separate from the writing and devising process. Um, and because of that, I think really, really, really interesting and exciting um, things happen when you're able to work that way and actually put it all in the room together <coughs> and build it um, from the bottom up from scratch. Um, so if you want to play the other part, sure. I'm going to um, so I also, I play a lot um, with uh, live, this is from a show, I think it's already open, is it? Yeah, it should be. Um, yeah, so um, this is from a show where, like a, a number of my shows, I've had a lot of live cameras, um, and I play a lot with drawing the audience's attention to um, uh, the, our relationship to media and mediated experience and um, the way that that shapes and informs us and um, the experience of liveness and live theater versus uh, sort of mediated, mediated experience. Is that, do we have audio for that? There's no audio coming out. Okay, well, <laughs> this one won't really make sense without audio, so I'll try to explain. Basically, um, uh, it's, it, this is a, a clip that is sort of, um, I, I'm playing it because we had been talking about So, I can, I, can you guys hear it? Yeah, okay, so I'm talking about um, performing myself, performing myself for you, and as I'm performing myself, I'm keenly um, observing and choreographing myself, performing myself for you, and um, as I am performing the solo show for you, and I am um, talking directly to you, I'm actually talking directly into a camera lens, um, while pretending to look at and talk to you. And while I'm actually imagining that I'm looking directly at you, I'm actually seeing my own reflection mirrored in the camera lens. And I'm sort of playing with um, all of these sort of meta layers of uh, live performance, solo performance, <clears throat> the construction of identity and self in theater and in life, um, and our relationship to the media and to, camera, to the camera. Um, you can go ahead stop that clip because we won't be able to hear the audio. Um, anyway, I played with a lot of different whatever's available at the time. I played with um, live video chats, live, um, live emailing, live web surfing, um, remote bi-located performance where there's interaction between people and audiences in different locations um, via live media. I'm playing now with um, more interactive and site-specific work. Um, including like public art, uh, interactive public art installation, and um, and some of the kind of roving interactive um, experiences like Desdemona's project, which is that. Mm. Was that the handoff? <laughs> <laughs> that was well done. 
answer. Uh, hi, I'm Desmond Chang. I um, actually self-identify as a stage producer. Um, I guess I'm slowly dipping my foot into the world of multimedia and technology. I wasn't really fascinated by technology because um, this, I think, is like more me than me. So I kind of, <laughs> kind of know this me. Uh, and I think in the past couple of years, I've been thinking about because I've been doing live, essentially, you know, your traditional either in a box for 10 plus years. And recently I've been thinking about um, Facebook and Twitter and all those things we all think about, like, oh, it's ruining our children, and it's nah, nah, and they it's gonna replace the person to person thing. And so I have always thought, um, if this phone is more me than me, like this phone knows all the numbers of people I love, it has what I'm doing for the day, it has like my calendar, it has my photos. Um, can I make theater with my phone? And so I proposed this project, the Triangle Lab at Intersection, and got a grant to do this experiment, um, and an experiment it certainly was, uh, to create a piece of theater using mobile technology and being not the most cleverly techno-friendly person um, for an artist. Uh, I decided to try making a play, air quote play, um, with QR codes. And so I essentially created, I um, worked with Christopher Chen, a local playwright, to create the story uh, that we call The Next Project. And essentially, um, you take this QR code, QR code is fancy. You essentially take your phone and you go to a location in downtown San Francisco, you scan the code, the code gives you a piece of content, you look at the content at the piece of story, you watch the story unfold and it takes you to the next location. You walk to the next location, you scan the next code. So it's kind of like a scavenger hunt slash theater game slash game system. Um, so if you were to scan that with your QR things, it should take you to, so this is kind of where the, my own techno, techno savviness is kind of sucky. Because uh, it'll take you to a YouTube video that you then have to watch. And so a lot of what I'm working with is just my capacity to do what I philosophically and ideologically want to do versus my actual ability to do these things, right? So when you watch this video on your phone, you essentially watch the first chapter of the story of the next project, which is um, a story about two characters who essentially communicate via text. And it's like watching a play if you're watching a text exchange on your phone. So it's like your phone, so you are the protagonist, your phone is the phone, and you essentially just watch the conversation happening. <laughs> and so I thought, is this, <laughs> the question was, is this interesting enough? Will people do this? And lo and behold, when we launched the project, we had a bunch of people standing in the corner of the edition staring at their phones, <laughs> watching people texting. <laughs> and so the answer was yes. Um, and then the problem was no one really came to, to not enough folks came to do it because the marketing was just not a, not a very good, um, we just didn't market it very well. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm thinking about is because what happened and then talking to Laura about this project opened up all these questions about oh my god I just made drama and there were no humans involved um, are these characters are these what what is it what am I going to see the show am I walking the show what exactly am I doing as the audience person consuming this piece of theater air quote theater right so that's kind of where I am um, yeah, stage director, dipping my foot into multimedia. Hi, uh, my name is David Slaza. I self-identify um, as a artist and producer and father. Um, and let's just show this. So there's a piece I made. Um, it's now eight years old, seven and a half years old. That is still a piece of people um, come up to me, talk to me about. I'm really. It's called Gadget. It's got the making a ton of bomb. And uh, let's just roll it. So this was, uh, uh, the concept of this piece is to tell a story through a live film. Can we go back to the top of it and play it with sound?
So that's me managing the video in a 360 degree environment that people are standing in the middle of, watching unfold. So it's hard to see this part of the video, but it's me with, um, at the time of DVD turntables, kind of remixing newscast and some found footage and pop culture stuff. That's me talking about it in a loop. So this is, and then goes to Red Dawn, and so this I take you through our perception of the fear around um, uh, nuclear weapons. Cut that. And uh, then, um, the Vine thing is really annoying. So can we just stop the sound on the video? Sorry. For a technology panel, um, it's amazing how many basic um, complications uh, we still are facing, even in places like Berkeley Repertory Theater in beautiful downtown Berkeley. Um, so this piece um, is called Full Balcony, which was, so the first piece I showed uh, is about how I was thinking about using technology to tell story, to actually engaging in turntables and these things to remix a story, some information you may be seeing before, you know it's Ronald Reagan, you can kind of imagine what he's gonna say, and then I twist what he's saying into a different story that I think is more true um, or more representative of how we might reflect on his messaging now in a more, with some hindsight. Um, so that's sort of one vein of things I work in. And I do that both as a designer with other writers and generative artists, and I uh, make author my own projects. This is called Full Out Me, um, which is a, um, also a Triangle Lab project through Cal Shakes and Intersection. Uh, I, um, remade the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet uh, through online self-submissions, so put out a broadcast all around the world, um, asking people to perform uh, the balcony scene into their cameras, to me, and uh, mainly on their laptops is how people chose to do that, and send me the clip, and then I re-edited them into a single balcony scene. Uh, and it was, so the concept around this is, what, how can you totally fuck casting, and um, <laughs> allow people to uh, do that, make those decisions on their own, and how can you um, kind of rethink what's possible in um, the way things are arranged. And, and then it became a task about editing. Me, then, as the artist, to say, okay, I've got these submissions. What do, what's the story I'm going to tell in butting people up against each other? Let me just let it play without the sound, it'll be fine. So um, I started it, that's me up at the bronze of Cal Shakes, and then it was installed up at the bronze of Cal Shakes. Um, and it's kind of cooler when you can hear it, but it's okay. You can go online and do it anyway. And then I cast Romeo and Juliet, or Romeo and Juliet. That guy's in Paris, you know, he's sent a singing, very good looking guy. Um, and so I'd be saying, uh, you know, oh, if I were a glove upon that hand. Um, anyway, um, so it was pretty clever, um, and it is a project that's available at fullbalcony.org, and also through my website. Fullbalcony.org may have expired. Um, and then uh, the other thing I'm doing now, if we cut this, well, uh, no, keep going. Yeah, okay. Um, the thing that I'm working on now is this. So this is, um, it's not video, it's a real thing I'm building uh, called Studio One, which is a mobile residency to, we could live in. Um, and you could actually talk to people inside of, intimately, in a 6 by 10 room, um, and have conversations, and it can be deployed wherever you want it to go. Um, it's premiering as a performance piece um, this summer, in um, and a micro-residency center. So it's, um, I'm going to be there, sometimes there, and sometimes not there, but I will be hosting. Um, other people to come and hang out in this and make work and hold conversations and uh, uh, do what they do as artists. 
Um, so, right, so video art. So my main thinking is around the mediated experience. What do we put between ourselves and our audiences? Or what do we take away between ourselves and our audiences? Uh, and how do we craft experiences that really uh, are appropriate to the use of technology that we want to do? There's no way I could have told the story of Gadget without, in my mind, without summoning these things uh, from, from pop culture and those references. Um, Full Balcony was totally made of, from other people's films. And, and now this is like, well, I want to be present with people and I want to talk to them about real things. I want to create a safe, weird, intimacy between us um, that we can um, relate to one another in. And so, because this, ultimately, what I'm pushing up against is this, like, I'm like, desperate to connect with you guys. <laughs> and it, because there's this, like, very strange wall, gap between us that sometimes is useful, and you can do things with if you know how to manage that relationship, but a lot of times, it's just kind of um, <coughs> antiquated, like, I'm just not into it anymore. So um, that's that's what I'm doing. You know. Yeah. We had a conference call a little while ago because these projects are so interesting and so different. We wanted to sort of get to know the ins and outs of our thinking about them um, before we actually got up here in front of everyone. And some of the questions that these folks came up with, we got really into. Um, and I think they're important when talking about technology and relationships. Um, one of them is intimacy. This, the, the idea of being in a room with someone and that being intimacy, that being safe. There are certain other kinds of intimacy that technologically mediated forms do provide. Asynchronous uh, communication like texting, different kind of intimacy. So all of your work addresses that in at least a little bit of a way. What do you think about intimacy and your work in <laughs> well, for me, I mean, I think intimacy is when people are vulnerable with one another. Like when you can create a state of vulnerability or off balance, or unexpectedness that that you're up like, oh, oh, and you become aware of yourself or how you're feeling, or you know, there's like this thing that you can do, and that like we have the benefit of that being in theater or in a live format. I think it's really interesting because I think I don't think the audience comes to theater to be vulnerable. I think the audience comes to theater to watch someone else be vulnerable. Because vulnerability in you is strength, vulnerability in me is weakness. So I mean, we we walk back, we're in the audience, and like, oh my god, oh my god, he's coming on the, oh my god, the actor's coming up. Don't come sit in my lap, don't sit in my lap. I'm not here, I'm not here. But I'm here to watch these actors kind of pour their soul out. So we want intimacy, we want intimacy given to us. This is my, my feelings, just, you know. Um, but we're not interested in being seen, which is why we're assholes on the internet, right? We're complete jerks on the internet. The comment thread of any like blog or website, right? We don't, I, there's something about how we like to consume stories. We want to hear someone tell their story. I think we're getting to a place now where that's slowly dissolving, where we're interested in performing. But even then, YouTubers and like video bloggers, I'm performing, but I'm still not being seen. Because I'm performing to a camera. And you can see it whenever you want, and I'm not responsible for the thing I throw out there and just give to you to look at whenever you feel like it. So I don't know, it's interesting, this vulnerable. And so I do agree with you. I agree with you up to a certain point, but I don't know if it's, it's entirely reciprocal, you know? Like, if I, got off, if I came off stage and sat in Sam's lap, he'd be like, what are you doing? This is not right. I'm going to find set up for this. Right? My ticket was not about me showing up. It was about me showing up to see you show up, performer. Well, I think that's changing. I think that's changing generationally. You know? I mean, in terms of the, um, the, the interest in and the hunger for and the willingness for real interactivity. Um, in, in other forms, at least, I think in the theater it's still it's still evolving, um, and it is evolving because interactive immersive theater is the new big thing in America this year <laughs> or last year. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's been happening in the rest of the world for a while, but um, 
But, you know, I think because younger generations are growing up um, so completely immersed in and um, very versatile and comfortable in um, different forms of interactivity. And I think, uh, you know, the explosion, for example, of, um, in a sense, like, like your project, you know, the kind of like interactive um, urban gaming kind of um, treasure hunt tour uh, kind of experiences um, are really, there's a reason that people are really soaking that up right now and, and looking for that. I think for, for me, some of what's been interesting up to, up until recently, I mean, it's still interesting for me, but um, in terms of theater, is, um, I'd like to talk about a little bit, is, is this construction of intimacy. This, and what, I think especially what, in terms of film, and cameras, and which translates to the internet and YouTube, and the whole kind of selfie culture, the constant um, sort of constructing and branding and shaping and editing and promoting and performance of self in culture um, is really fascinating. And I think it's a it's something that I'm interested. I've played with a lot in performances. Again, sort of directly addressing that in the context of theater and the live experience of theater and the sort of um, complicated layers of self-performing some other self. Um, and the difference between me in this room with you right now and that form of live embodied intimacy and the other kind of intimacy that you feel when I'm in a close-up on camera and you can see my eyes, and you feel like you're inside my head, and I can construct this other thing for you, and I think that's such a powerful experience now that people are able to do that themselves. People are able to do that, just pick up their iPhone and be on camera, be on film right now, and to construct um, these layers of identity. And I'm also really interested in just um, this sort of, again, this sort of illusion of relatedness, this illusion of um, the construction of intimacy, the way that, you know, I, I mean, some people feel, you know, closer to porn than they feel to their partner. I mean, there's so many different manifestations of that um, in culture right now. And what's, sorry, really quickly, what's interesting about what you just did, Sarah, was like, when you're talking to the group, and as you're talking to the group, you're talking to the group, but when you do this, it's like, just for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the intimacy actually, I'm oh, sorry, I'm just like thinking out loud. It, it feels like, if we didn't create theater just for me, <laughs> That's what we all want, right? It feels like it's, like when I'm in the movie theater, I feel like it's just for me. In the theater, there's like all these people around me, and there's like crackling sounds of candy, and like, you know, people rustling, and someone coughing. It's like, ugh. It's not just for me, it's for us. I think this is part of, yeah, I think this is part of also what's, we're going to talk about this sort of, the, the room for projection. Part of what is so, I mean, if anybody has ever had a, an actual long distance relationship, raise your hand, you know, or been in a relationship where you're long distance sometimes, um, you, there is something uncanny about the space that texting or emailing for example, allows when you don't actually have to take in that whole actual other person in your face and all of the layers of complication and three-dimensionality <laughs> and incongruency yeah, there. But yeah, you have room to actually fill in the gaps yourself and to be in this very internal subjective experience that it sometimes can actually feel more intimate. I've been think, talking a lot, a lot lately in my process with people about um, the relationship we have with our stuffed animals when we're kids. And that sort of, and the way that we actually continue to do that as adults, in a way, um, the to infuse even inanimate objects, or even you know an email, for example, um, with so much projected emotion and related relationship and intimacy. There's a, a for 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 every ten articles on the internet of studies about how instant messaging and all kinds of asynchronous communication, email, all that stuff, um, is dissolving emotional ties and kids don't know how to be truthful anymore. Or they don't know how to relate with their peers and their families anymore. There are about two or three articles that study how certain, certain, certain new kinds of intimacy are being tracked through these media. There is one that I sent around to all of us, and I'd be happy to put it on the TBA site, about a, a involved in narrative. A parent comes home from work, kids on the computer, how are you doing, honey, how's your day? Fine. They go into separate rooms, they start talking on IM. 
and she tells, and, and he tells his mom how his day really was. Now, the study, there, there's a study that breaks down uh, what the components of intimacy are vis-a-vis -vis these, uh, these media, things like um, self-disclosure, acceptance, affection, and there's a couple other of these components that are being broken down in a way I think we haven't had cause to before. Um, so considering which of these components a digital, are, are more at home in a digital medium, you know, I've definitely texted things to people I would never say to them in person, probably today. But, um, but it also does, in a certain way, call your attention back to liveness. Like, even in the you know, most technologically, beautifully detailed um, performance, it, when then when the performer comes up to you or when you see them in the flesh, it means something different. Now that we have an alternative to liveness, liveness has more semantic heft, or it has a different semantic heft that we can use as artists. Um, so that's cool. I like that semantic heft. <laughs> also, it kind of, um, I mean, again, this is, it's, it's interesting working in this over the last couple decades because I feel like in the last, like the, the, you know, the email thing I was just showing you, that's from 2005. I mean, that's really like, which at the time, a lot of people weren't doing that in theater yet. It was like, oh my god, that's so cool. Um, but now it's like, you know, second hand, it's completely outdated. Um, but it's so interesting, it's changing so fast, and I think the media literacy of the audience is changing so fast, and especially as younger generations are coming up. I think as a theater artist, you, you have to take for granted, you have to understand your audience's <coughs> level of media, or media literacy, even in the terms of the way that they relate to language, for example, and the way that they relate to... Um, Talk more about that. <laughs> well, I can text you about it if you want to know. <laughs> LOL. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, like your project, um, your, your research we're talking about, and I think, you know, we've, we've all worked with this, with the, even like as playwrights, as, the, as writers, the way that we, um, our relationship to language and the way we write, write language for the stage and write language <laughs> both that comes out of people's mouths and that comes out of people's mouths to a live audit, to a large audience versus to a camera, versus on a microphone, versus through a text or an email. Um, those are all, all have their, their own particular language and like, linguistic style now. Well, one cool thing I saw in both of your projects is you have uh, an availability on the screen of seeing someone write something and then delete it, and then write something else and then delete it. You are in, in the real time of that performance moment watching someone change their mind and seeing all the things they don't say which is not something easy to do in theater, but also a particular kind of self-expression that people don't have to speak. They know what it means to like go this far in a sentence and like, nope. And that process of evaluating and curating is very native to like anyone younger basically than me. Um, but how does that work in, um, how does it that work in your media at all? Like being able to capture what people don't see or does this apply at all? Yeah. Um, I think editing. Yeah, I, I mean editing is, you know, ultimately I, it, I'm interested in story and telling story and that's why I am in a, I'm theater. Uh, because it's story and it's not um, film, which also is story, but it's and it's not something in a gallery which you would might deprioritize story or a public art project or whatever. But that this it's it is about story and um, see I oh, know it's I just can't keep them today. <laughs> um, and that there's a uh, I don't know what the question was, but but really the the, how do you tell the story as best you can? How do you keep re-engaging in the relationship and um, and re-engaging with your audiences? And and sometimes and that takes different tactics for different situations. Um, and yeah, if you want to show somebody thinking about what they're doing, like yeah, maybe you back up forward, back up forward. Um, but yeah, my, I mean the main thing that I'm I my 
many of my main influences are around remix culture and DJ culture and, and taking something that exists on a record or a film and, and, and reworking that to be your own thing and telling story through that and using pieces of stuff that maybe aren't made to tell stories to tell a story. So, you know, remixing uh, somebody brushing their teeth, you know, 50 different times to tell a story about how they miss their mom. If you could just imagine what that would be like, like that, that sounds like something I would do. <laughs> well, it's certainly go one of two ways, either to the fact that this means of digital production are in basically everyone's hands. Now you've got your camera here, you've got your video camera here, you've got your sound studio, your audio mixer all here. And um, how much does that, how much does your audience is basically catching up or passing us in technology affect the questions that you're asking as you're laying out work, as you're exploring work? Right, and what point does me making a theater piece just a version of someone else living their real life? <laughs> right? Like me going, whoa, no, a theater piece. And like, you know, my favorite little kid in the corner is going, whoa, yeah, real life. You know? So that's, that's what I'm curious about. Like when we start to, I mean, sure, at some point, we all came to the theater and we watched this, because we like, oh, that's real life. Right? And now we're doing the same thing where we're like a replicating text message, oh, that's real life. I don't know. It, it kind of begs the question, so what is theater supposed to be reflecting and what is it, what is it, why do we why do we make the work we make in the American theater and why are we making these types of works that it's a kind of maybe theater, right? And like how do you wanna how do you wanna define what you consider to be theater? Is it humans? Is it without humans? Is it the lack of screenings? Is it what is it that makes this, you know, either a departure from what we consider to be traditional theater or an evolution? <coughs> Do you, who out there feels that the divide between theater and not theater is important and defensible? I'm not saying it's not, I'm, I just want to start a conversation. What do you mean important and like, like that there is a In, line? Important oh. to you and your work, that how you approach your work, um, at a certain point you'll stop and say, that's not theater anymore. Like where, where, is, where are people's lines as you're, as you're answering your questions and working toward answering your questions? Um, I mean, I've used a lot of technology in my work. Um, um, but um, for me, and I don't know if this is true, but for me, unless there's a live body in front of me, I don't really track with it as theater. Um, it can be all projection <laughs> other than that live body. Um, they might not even be doing it. I don't, you know what I mean? I feel like for me, theater is about me as audience member being in literally the same space physically with a performer. Having said that, um, I do think that technology gives us, but that's from where I'm coming from in the sense that uh, I grew up, I have recently adopted a lot of technology, I didn't grow up in it. Um, so my niece probably feels like her friends are in her room when she's IMing with them in a way that I don't. Um, so her, ex her response to this question could be very different in the sense that her, for her seeing a screen and somebody on the screen might actually carry more semantic heft than it does for me. Um, and that, I think, is really interesting. Amber, did you see that? Sorry, I'm going to go this Did you see the production of No Eggs at ACT? Yes. Okay. Yes. Was that theater? Okay, okay. Who, saw, was, who, who, who saw that production? It regard. totally was because there was a ballet that I could see the whole time. <laughs> and, I got to, and I got to see them when they walked out. You know, there were moments in it where I was reminded that I was actually watching people doing this. Even though they weren't in the room, they were still doing live things in the next room. It was, it's an interesting question, room. though. Hmm? I, yeah. I would say yes, okay. but that's I, 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 don't, I don't really answer. Oh, that. I know. It just, just came just, up in our discussion, um, you know, the other day when we were having a pre-discussion about just um, yeah, but just like about how much that's coming up right now in the field. Like I was just on a grant panel where um, you know a number of the panelists were. One person with a, was applying with, um, she's primarily a YouTube artist. Like, she's a performer. She's, she's a performer and writer. Um, but she, her main medium is YouTube. She has a YouTube channel. She's very popular on it. She writes these skits and these characters that she performs. And, um, and she was applying in, in the theater category. And there was another project that was mainly like a site-specific, interactive, um, multimedia kind of public event. Um, and where these questions of like, 
what is the performative element, or is that why why is that an application in the theater category as opposed to another category? And it, I think you know we're all confronting those issues, not just in the, in the funding field, but for real in the um, you know in, in terms of our relationship with our audience. It's, it's really interesting. New questions. We have a bunch of folks. We'll just just go around. It was not here. Just um, actually, I would have answered the same way he did about um, being an audience member being in the same space. Mm -hmm. But then when I heard him say that, I think about um, met the Metropolitan Opera performing simulcast across the country. That's still theater to me. I think when I thought about it right now, my answer is when I lose my audience, it stops being theater. When they don't get it, it's no longer theater. As long as they're there and engaged, Wherever there happens to be, it's still theater. Regardless of what level of technology, did it stop being theater when we started miking actors? No, we just applied new technology to tell a story. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's the integration of technology and performance is a continuum that started a long time ago, and we have many, many miles to go in this, and you just have to check in where you're at right now. These, I was joking, there's a, a light fixture that was designed in the mid 80s probably that's being held by a coffee can to make it look like it was from the 20s you know on stage here in our contemporary production um, you know it's like and we even have to deal with the layers of nostalgia and remembrance there's so much um, kind of built into each technology that we have to interface with that's part of the story when you um, <coughs> just to deal with and I just think it's about accepting that. I think that's a really good point because a lot of this uh, multidisciplinary stuff is using the tools at hand. It's not theater artists or video arts, it's artists pursuing things using the tools at hand and they have these tools, they have liveness and interactivity tools, and they have digital tools and expanding the vocabulary in any in any direction is going to shape your questions, but it's um, but it's just a question of what tools you have and what tools you're interested in refining your grasp on. Like um, these this uh, light here with the coffee can in front. I don't know what's being held down over here, but it's being held down by some gaff tape and a plastic cup from the yogurt place down the street. Not kidding, right there. Tools at hand. If you have something you need to do as an artist, you will find the tools that you need in order to get it done. If it's a plastic yogurt cup, if it's your YouTube thing. So. I think it's actually a potato starch cup. <laughs> Is it a potato starch cup? Yeah, I don't think it's plastic. It's from Gelateria at night on the street. Um, but yeah, the tools at hand, I guess. Yeah. Um, I am really enchanted and still fixated on this teddy bear metaphor. And um, so, so I would love to think about that for a while. Teddy bear metaphor. I, okay. I would love this the stuffed animal that we can project all of our, our needs and desires and sort of childhood fantasy on, and then translating that into the actor as object and what what you're dealing with. I would love for you to talk more about whether or not you think there's a sweet spot to hit where like, where is intimacy, where, where does intimacy overlap with our needs and projections in theater? <coughs> and how can technology aid or detract from kind of finding that sweet spot, if there is one? Well, I think one of the things that's interesting about theater, right, is that is, that, is the sweet spot moment that's absolutely live where you feel like the audience really felt that. You know, where like you say something and everybody just explodes in laughter or something, you know, or you feel the in the room. Um, I just got chills. <laughs> so, because I, was, I grew up doing theater and I get, right? Like we all know what that feels like. That's something that you can't experience as a film actor on, on, if you're not if you're not in the movie theater every time the audience watches the movie. Um, it's something you can't experience as a visual artist if you're not in the gallery every single day if the gallery is open. Um, experiencing that live moment in time and space with, with the audience. Um, and I think, for me, like in live, in live events, that's still a really charged, powerful, interesting interaction, um, even no matter how much technology is also involved in mediating that. And, and for me, sometimes I feel like the more that I play with media and technology um, and sort of calling our attention to our, the relationship with that, you know, sometimes, those, um, it, sometimes it even amplifies those moments. 
Um, but I, I feel like in, in my work I often keep commenting on and drawing the audience's attention back to um, <coughs> losing themselves in the, like losing the, um, being so drawn into the content they lose the awareness of the form and then being woken back up to the medium that's actually being manipulated in order to give them the experience. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Um, in terms of what you're talking about, that the, the, the rare article that actually investigates how it aids certain forms of intimacy to be mediated through digital technology, yep. um, do, you, do you think that there's a particular, like, particularly theatrical kind or flavor of intimacy that you feel really gets a lift from technology? Or, you know, or are we just kind of trying to bring the familiar into this antiquated space? Can I try that? Yeah. I mean, I think the things that make you that disarm you in intimate ways, there are tools to help with that. Some people like sex toys, and some people like Skyping naked, or not. Uh, you know, and it's not even just about intimacy, it's like sexual intimacy, but there's, I think there's all different kinds of tools to get yourself intimate. From the mic game to like whatever, you know. Um, I just try it. And also, what I've seen in projects where the technology is a really successful integral component of it and not just something stuck up afterwards or, or in the background, is that part of the content is the medium. Mm -hmm. Like, part of, what, part of what struck me about Next when I saw it the first time is it was really digging into why do you feel close to this person? Because it will turn around and be like, you don't actually know what you think you know, or you don't actually know something incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So making a piece where you're problematizing this kind of intimacy. Like, what does this intimacy mean? When does intimacy become threatening? Um, why do we assume that we know things we don't? Uh, are there things that we do know by virtue of how someone expresses themselves in writing that you meet them and it's, you don't know those things? Um, but it, is, it ends up being important when you're using these technological tools that the inquiry involves the use of that kind of communication, like exploring how that communication works, what are its pitfalls, what are its rewards, what, what new paths can it lead you down? I wonder too, I, I don't know how much time we have left, but I, I've, I, and this is all super interesting, but I also don't want to lose track of some of the things that people at the beginning brought up when we asked about your interest and um, actually, you know, this we keep coming back to um, well, the process. You know, the, the medium has to be integral to the to the content. The content and form have to be sort of in an ongoing process with each other, um, or it doesn't have to be. But I think we work that way, and, and a certain kind of work comes out of that. But it does also bring back like really practical questions, like if you're working in a union theater, um, and I think maybe maybe that'd be an interesting thing to talk about, like not just the sort of like larger philosophical and aesthetic. Questions, but like a really practical thing <laughs> for you. That all sounds great, but how do we actually do that? Um, and I know that I'm, I could never have made the work that I've made if I was only working in a union theater. Um, I've, I've had to make this work in very small, low-key DIY spaces, and then sometimes translate it into a union theater, which is also its own challenge, and I think it's also interesting even for the unions and the venues, how that conversation, and David, you can probably talk even more about this, is how that conversation is evolving. Um, because, and even how, you know, when I did the show we were looking at at Yerba Buena, I was super, super lucky to have a really amazing crew um, that was willing to be more flexible in terms of the, um, the boundaries between disciplines and uh, intermedia, so who could touch the camera and who could touch the microphone, and could I touch my own things because I have to touch them in the work, and um, I think that's also a really evolving conversation. I know that um, the people, the production team at Yerba Buena worked really, really hard with the union crew to make sure they had the right crew for my show that understood the kind of work that it was and what was going to have to be involved. Yeah, I mean, I had the great pleasure to sit on the uh, the equity negotiation as the rep from Z Space to negotiate the equity contract for the Bay Area theaters, and um, you know they're terribly afraid. The union representatives are terribly afraid of actors' imagery being reproduced without their compensation in mind, and 
everyone, I'm sure. I don't know, if, did the back get renegotiated recently? I did it several years ago now. Next month? Yeah. I mean, it's brutal, and it's just kind of dumb. Not in a bad way, but it's not, uh, if membership, representative membership wasn't really there, it's the union leaders who are there, who are, I guess, our representative membership, but were membership polled about some of these specific things, I'd be very curious to know what their response rate was. But, but no, but there are ways around it that are fine. Like, well, if the context in which things are made is one thing. So, Full Balcony, which is this film piece, evaded Actors' Equity's <coughs> jurisdiction in that it was designed to be set up as a public art installation. It was funded with theater grant money through the Triangle Lab and through another foundation that vows not to fund video. Okay, so it, so it would, I mean, it's very weird how to make the cases, but I think tell the right story to the wrong people and, and just go for it. And my, uh, so far, I use tons of stolen and reappropriated material in my work. I use lots of imagery of people who have representation around their image and things like that. And, and, and I'm looking for and waiting to be sued. As a, a public response and a meaningful one to the work, and what, uh, and I'm preparing my time, since I graduated grad school, which was part of my work was about how to prepare for that moment, has been about trying to make that moment real and get sued. Because this broadcast will live forever I, online. Right. So. You know, maybe after I go through the lawsuit, I'll look back on this and say, "See, he was trying." But but I'm not, I'm mainly looking to push the barriers around. Well, what, who owns your image, in what circumstances? Um, if you're the United States government, there's an entitlement to owning everything you do, if they want to check it out. You know, so it's, but can we, can I use Ronald Reagan and make him say something different? Or, you know, so I just, I, I mean, Ronald Reagan, and he's kind of in the public domain, sort of, but he's a union actor. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, you know, anyway, so. But, and then in stagehand stuff, there's a different, I think each um, uh, silo of labor has its own conversation. And the ones, and it's weird between SAG and, and stage and, and equity and film, and it's like kind of finding the gray area in each of their agreements. And just read the agreements. I encourage you to, if you're an artist who wants to, to ride the gray area in an actor's contract, and you, or you want a union actor to be part of your thing, read their agreement so you can help them understand what they're able to do or not do. So the fact that these contracts were drawn up before all this media existed is both a hindrance and in some ways a help, because you can they not are it. Well, I mean, we wrote this, the union contract was written just a few years ago. Facebook existed and YouTube existed and all this stuff. I mean, they redo it every three or four or five years, whatever it is. I mean, they know what's going on. It's just about the unwillingness to make concessions to the changing world. We didn't actually get all the way around that folks with yeah, the hands up. Yeah, the red shirt had his hand up about six times. <laughs> I don't mean to point you out, but there you go. Oh, no worries. Okay. Uh, no, I, my response is more to the line between like the finding audience, viewer, and I think the thing about theater is it comes back to me as a community. My problem with if it's for a performance for one audience member, you know, uh, at least the way I was brought up with theater <coughs> is that there's an uplift into the community discussion. If I just watch it off of YouTube, who do I have to share that with? And I think that's something even in the dark, this of the theater space, so makes us different from film is if we've done the work in, in a way or we've had that, that, that level of, uh, that, that bearing of soul, you know, the group can feel that palpable energy from the audience. I mean, part of why I came to see this is that, you know, I think that what Tech, tech does really well, the media, is that there's always these three unities of time, place, and character. But with the use of media, you know, you can actually see somebody's soul, even if it's metaphorically represented, up there. You can actually, I love the remixing idea, change with the idea of like, you know, fixing or refixing, but that time is, is, is not fixed in a way. 
and sort of, but the other thing is, you know, as someone who, you know, as a director, as a advisor, as a writer, I can play with that, but I'm not sure how far to go. And I like the, the, the sort of like the bigger conceptual aesthetic questioning that, that it's sort of here, you know, how far can we push it? Because the thing is, is that, you know, I'm not, I, I'm only speaking to the generation I came up with. You know, I look at my younger nephew and nieces, yeah, they got iPads and stuff, but they process narratives so much rapidly and differently than I do. And I, I look and sort of say, well, it can't just be about videoing, you know, us playing with video and that anymore. It's actually got to figure out how to get Flappy Bird in there and then unpack it into something else. Because that's the thing, is when you see a, uh, what you guys can do with media, which I think is so incredible, I'm still very old school, still about an actor on boards. But when you can actually get close to that microphone, change the audio, you know, territory of the space, change the way that you can actually see the image and the inter interactivity of the image. Yeah, I just want to echo one point that I think is really important is the, the shortening of narrative is a very contemporary thing that's happening. And I, I there will be a sort of backlash around it or whatever, but it's 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 that's real right now. It's like I think that, we have that, seen it. More and more theaters yeah. putting on like a full day of seven plays. Oh, or, like the continuous. shotgun play where it's yeah. you know, yeah. long art narratives and an epic theater experience. Your body in that place for so and, long. And that's the the like anti push to Twitter, which is you know can you say everything in your designated character limit and get used to only thinking in seventy characters or whatever it is. You know, it's like my brain only works in seventy characters. I mean, it's like, so you need to make seventy character story. How many characters? Are there? 140. 140. So I'm only using half. <laughs> well, I have a question then too, going back to community. Um, we as theater people tell ourselves over and over, oh my gosh, we bring people together. Oh my gosh, there's nothing like being in the same room with a bunch of people and having an emotional experience. What about the share function of, say, this video that you like? You don't have to have your 17 best friends in the room with you to share this experience with them. What's the difference? What do we want to do with that? And you can share it with a much wider audience. I can send so it to my sister in Stockholm. I can send it to my brother. Like, there's a real sharing. It's a very real sharing. That doesn't mean less. It just means different. How do we? What do we do with that? But there's a reason why this is still a, thea a theatrical conversation. There's a reason why the three of you are not working in a film or a closed, you know, video that it, you're just making a media that's being digested by being shared out. There's still something about this that, that likes the audience or wants to interact with an audience. Even Desdemona, your piece, which was, I mean, I'm interested in how you reacted to that. Were you present? Did you go to the corners where people were taking in the, the QR feeds and watching their reaction to things? Were you yeah, there a lot? Uh, we had a launch party uh, last fall where Intersection essentially, like, there it is, and, and people came and they had their phones and the funniest thing. I actually made the project with the intent of it being a solitary experience. I was, it, was, it was meant to be theater for one, that was the whole point. And what ended up happening is that one person would scan, and then five would crowd around that person and they'd all watch the same screen. So it was still, it was like, oh, it's still a group experience. They're still like, oh, I, I, I got it. They, the first person who got it loaded, everyone else gathered on the campfire and they watched that video. And I was like, oh, well, shoot, there goes my audience of one theory. Yes, but you're being present with them. Like, how, what would be the difference between what you described earlier as a film experience where, you know, you're not present at every screening of the film as a performer, so you don't interact with the audience that way. What's the difference between that and what you did? Um, I, I didn't interact with the audience. Uh, um, I think that I think like I was trying to be as not present as possible because I was more interested in kind of data mining the reaction because the whole experiment was meant to be like oh how is audience behavior responding to this kind of system right it wasn't about like the art was one thing but I was really interested in like group behavior and individual and how individuals respond to technology as narrative and it was more about watching them and I was trying to be a fly on the wall I don't know how useful that was because I you know. They would ask me questions like, oh, was that meant to be? And I'm like, shh, I'm not here. <laughs> Go and be. You know? And then Laura did it, and she had her own thoughts about it, too. So uh, it's been interesting. <laughs> well, I think it's, it, it is, it's interesting, even though you know, I was talking about when, when the artist is present with the audience, I think it's amazing making work where 
the, ge the creator or the generator of the work maybe isn't there, um, but the audience is still having a, a live interactive experience that they're responding to. And, and one thing I also want to mention, I was actually tracking the codes the frequency with which they scan when they got scanned. And I was trying to figure out, like, oh, does it get boring at code four? And so like scan, 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 and stop. You know, so that's what I was interested in too. Like there's also all this back end data that we collected um, from the QR codes because they've been tracking everything. Uh, like how often they got scanned, how many scans per day, what time of day was most popular, did it affect like, you know, and you're in the Soma district, which is a really scuzzy area of San Francisco. You know, I saw no one scanning at night. <laughs> All the scans were during the day, you know, around lunchtime. Um, so that was interesting too. Okay. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah, we have about 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, so uh, here's my question. Uh, you all are three very cool artists doing very different work from each other. Um, and you mentioned being, you know, at the vanguard of a form that's changing every year. So I would love for you to paint me a picture of where you think it's going in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Did when you, you ask are, about the future of the American theater 10 years ago? 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, but I, when you are old and gray and return to a panel on the same topic, I want to know what kind of project you think you'll be talking about. I'll be a panel on the same project still. Oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think that they'll be talking about this in the same way anymore. Yeah. I, I totally think that. Um, I was actually having a conversation the other day with somebody before I even met you and heard about your project because I missed it when it happened, unfortunately. Um, about, you know, I feel like actually the, the, the imminent future, not 10 years from now, but I think much sooner than that, is, is like a mashup between Sleep No More, a video game, like World of Warcraft, Second Life. <laughs> you know, social media, Burning Man. Um, it, it's a very, uh, it's, it's kind of a mashup between live, interactive, um, site-specific, roaming, purse, like one on, audience of one and audience of countless many, um, interacting when, in both like live embodied ways and virtual mediated ways, and um, does everyone know what I'm, I'm referring to when I say sleep no more? New York production. The New York production, yeah, where it's a, you know, version of Macbeth that takes over a place over like a six different floors of a warehouse <laughs> simultaneously over the course of three hours and everybody's just running around and having um, uh, a very, very interactive, immersive experience of it. So I, I think that's one of the, one of the features of theater. Just really quickly, I, I love the meta theatricality of you guys are under this proscenium arch, that's under a proscenium arch, <laughs> and then the screen behind is essentially the proscenium arch into the new digital theater, and the work you guys are doing is, is very much, we talked about accessibility, and I think, thank you for talking about the equity issue, because that was one of the ones that um, but I really would love to continue this conversation online, because I agree with what Evan said about what theater is. Like if there's a heartbeat in the room and you guys are in the same space, it's theater. We're in here in theater talking about digital theater, talking about all these new forms, this evolving thing. I'd love to have this just as an ongoing discussion and a repository for what comes out of the BAT discussion and how, how these promulgated agreements get done between sag Africa and equity. So that those of us who actually do want to pay in health and pension and, and do all the, the things because everybody videotapes everything, right? And as a playwright, I want to hear my words, I want to, but I also want to play by the rules, and some of my best friends are equity actors, and I don't want to misuse their you know, image. So I would love to have the adult conversation in the 21st century that can go beyond this proscenium arch and really have this, let's all be frank and fearless and figure out what this next step is. Do you think that happen? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be on next year's Theater and Technology panel. Thank you. One response to something you said, which was when you put post it or when you shared a video, um, I think it's beyond just liking it, but it's almost like you need to comment or blog in order to get that community feel, that interactivity. I think also, too, as we're thinking of the future of theater, we should, you know, technology has been driving a lot of the generational conversation. 
one of the things that you look at at the Google Plus is that now they call it circles, which, uh, funny enough, going back to theater, uh, as, as, as coming from a company that practices it in old ways, we always circle up before we start in rehearsals. And I think in sort of a tech way, that closing of the loop is that you know, when you put something out there, how it comes back to you. Um, not to think about audiences anymore, because you know, audiences, there's that whole consumer relationship, but that just circles, and that the work that goes out there, will, how it'll come back to them. Yeah, I mean, don't forget that technology is being molded after the things we already do. It's trying to help us to do the things that we need to do more, efficient, more efficiently. I mean, that's why developers are doing these things. Google Glass is now available to purchase today, to, so you don't have to spend the 23 seconds that it takes to unlock your phone and check your email. You can just go. I mean, whether yeah, whether that's like a goal of yours or not, you get to decide. But that's so the we have more command over the development of technology or the way in which it's implemented than you might feel. You might feel subject to this conversation, but we are, the, you know, or you might feel the object of this conversation, but we are in fact the ones being looked at to help define it. So, stay strong, <laughs> be thoughtful. The biggest thing is to be as smart as you can be. I think, take your time and be smart, because people are watching. Alright, one last question. I, I, uh, I look forward to the different technologies advancing. There were several years before the next room, I did a, a play wherein I spent most of my time on stage interacting with an image on the screen. Mm -hmm. The other actor was in the building, but and he could hear me, but he couldn't see me. So I had problems with uh, if he dropped the line. I had no way of visually communicating with him that something needed to happen. <laughs> he could hear what I was saying, but he couldn't see what I was saying. So, but uh, I'm sure there's further technology now that that could have been fixed. <laughs> There's an app for that. <laughs> yes. That's called mind reading. <laughs> it's around the corner. I think we both was working on that. <laughs> and they're going to patent the word mind and the word reading. You, you heard that Google's trying to patent the word glass, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah. As a, sh as a shortened form of Google Glass, they're trying to copyright glass. Yeah, yes. It's interesting. It's, we live in interesting times. And I think we shouldn't be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's something about, like, I, we may not have them. I can't. <laughs> we don't like what everyone knows of it. Right. And, it, and a lot of it's going to be bad. I'm guilty of making a lot of bad stuff with cameras. I so old <laughs> every day for the theater. Um, but I think there's something about just, like, like David said, like, acknowledging it's here. It's not going anywhere. You might as well just shake his hand and walk him to the table. Yeah. And here, I think going going at the technology versus theater, uh, film or video mediated versus theater thing, from the from the artist end is the wrong way to go about it. Like I make theater or I make video art or something. What are people taking in? I don't think the people looking for something exciting to look at are thinking nearly as hard about whether it's theater or video as we are. So if you're making something that's interesting, use the stuff that makes it the most interesting. But what is that stuff? How do you get those tools? And how do you not be, um, how do you keep focused on the future of what people are looking for and what people are finding interesting? Ever. And then um, I've got all the signs. Yeah, I think done. it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of conversation to be had um, around projections or sound editing. I mean, all these things are technology. Sound design is technology. You know what I mean? Like, unless you're one actor on stage with no sound, no lights, performing outside, <laughs> in front of, you know what I mean? You're using technology, so it's in there. That's We're called only, evangelism. You know what I mean? So we were like, we're using it. But to me, um, this is something you said, David, that um, I've been thinking a lot about, so that was really interesting, this idea of shortening the narrative. Um, in the sense that technology happens to be in our lives all the time, almost 24 seven, every day. There is a new generation coming up who's been living with it their whole lives. So it's actually how they take in information, how they feel emotion, how they respond to things, has been shaped by Facebook, Twitter, iPhones, iPads, what have you. Um, so how does that, very few people now actually watch a movie and just watch it. 
They have something in their lap laptop is on there. So they're actually taking in multiple things. So whenever I see a show as someone who's like that, where it's really slow and it's really exposition, I get bored because my brain has been trained to get ahead. Because of iPads, now there's swiping. In our brains, next thing comes from the right. You know what I mean? Well, so we've left to write. Oh, yeah, but you know what I mean? So it's like, how do we, what does that mean for a theater piece that doesn't use projections? What does it mean about layering story? And that's something that I'm really interested in, and I think that's where you get a lot of tension is because an older audience member or an audience member who's not as technologically advanced might say, I can't get all this information. This is, you haven't given me enough time to think about it, whereas if I am bored stiff. You know what I mean? In the audience, because you just spent 10 minutes of my time explaining something to me <laughs> when I wanted to get to the next thing nine minutes ago. And, you know, and, that's, it, and that's a question. When do you go with it? When do you go against it? And I, I hope we can all start being specific and mindful of our decisions around that. Our time is up. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Some of these articles I was talking about on intimacy and, and asynchronous communication are going to put up on the TBA website, along with the websites of these fantastic artists. You can get more of their work and get to know more of what they're working on. So, thanks again.